Lord, we come before you and we thank you. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Not only are you welcome, take the reins <laughs> and just go ahead, take the mic and preach. Holy Spirit, you lead us, you speak to us. Just as we, as we want to get in the habit of doing, Paul tells us to be quick to listen and slow to speak. Can we just listen for a minute? Take a minute if you're at home or here, just take a minute. We're going to be quiet for a second as we just wait on the Spirit and we ask Him to speak and help us to listen. I hear you, Holy Spirit. I hear you. You're calling us to live by faith, to yield to you, to give you more space to work into our lives, to work in our lives and that we might honor you and serve you. I pray that as we look at your word today that you would indeed speak to us and that you would lead us and you would guide us and that we would surrender all to you. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. So we're, this is part two of a sermon message on the manifestation gift of the Spirit known as the gift of tongues. And we started this message last week. This is part of an overall series that we're in called The Presence and the Power of the Spirit that is actually going on longer than we expected, but amen, we're just, we're just uh, surrendering to the Spirit. And so this is part two. If you haven't if you weren't here for part one, please uh, feel free to go online and, and, and get that message. But what we're looking at is the, is the manifestation gift known as the gift of tongues. And I'm just going to give you a quick recap from last week so that we can all get uh, be on the same page. But I want to encourage you, if you have your handout, um, if you're here and you have your handout and you don't have your Bible, we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 14. So we're going to be doing almost a verse by verse for most of the verses in that chapter. We're going to be looking at those verses. So if you don't have your Bible, you can just pull it up. It's right. I have the entire uh, chapter in the handout, which is in the middle of uh, this packet here. And so you'll have that. If you have your Bible, open up to 1 Corinthians 14. But as we, as we looked last week at the gift of tongues, and tongues, we learned last week, is just the Greek word glossa or glossa, which means languages. It's the gift of other languages. And uh, we, looked at, we, we looked at the book of Acts to kind of inform us about the Holy Spirit and the gift in particular. And we looked at Acts chapter 2 in the day of Pentecost. If you recall, they were all the disciples. All of them were filled with the Spirit, all were filled with the Spirit, and the Spirit gave them utterance as they spoke in other tongues and other languages. And so the unique thing about Pentecost is that unlike the Old Testament, when the Holy Spirit was, was, came upon or filled individuals, uh, this, in Acts chapter 2, when Pentecost came, the Holy Spirit fell on all of them, and they all began to speak in tongues. And they were declaring the mighty works of God. This heavenly language that they were speaking in, this language that was unknown to them, was actually declaring the mighty works of God. And all who heard them from all these other uh, places and languages were perplexed and amazed. And that was Acts chapter 2. and Acts chapter 10, we looked at how uh, Peter was speaking to the Gentiles. And as he was speaking to them, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And they received the gift of the Holy Spirit, and they began speaking in tongues. All of them, all of them received the Holy Spirit. All of them began uh, extolling and praising and glorifying God in tongues or another language. And then in chapter 19, we looked at how Paul was, um, was passing through the inland country and came to Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. And there he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, who are you talking about? You know, we never heard of the Holy Spirit. And so he, it says then that on hearing this, that Paul told them about the Holy Spirit, on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, they, the Holy Spirit came upon them, all 12 of them, and they began speaking in tongues in this other heavenly language. 
and prophesying. So uh, here they were filled with the Spirit, as we saw in those three accounts. They were all filled with the Spirit. When they were filled with the Spirit, they spoke in tongues. So what did we learn from these stories? What we learn is that speaking in tongues or other languages, as the Lord gives us, is one byproduct of being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's just one byproduct. It's not the byproduct. As Acts, there are 22 accounts in Acts about people coming to follow Jesus, and only three of them have them speaking in tongues when they did so. So it's a gift. It's one byproduct of the Spirit, but it's not the byproduct. Uh, and so w- the thing that we also looked at last week is just the idea that the gifts of the Spirit, as we see demonstrated in the New Testament, as we see demonstrated uh, in Acts, that those gifts, the manifestation gifts that, uh, that come from the Spirit, the manifestation gifts, that they are still for us today. And so there is this theory or there is this uh, teaching that it's called cessationism that that all the gifts of of the Spirit have ceased with the writing of the New Testament and they're not available to us today. That there is no more manifestation of the miraculous. There's no more manifestation of healing. There's no more manifestation of the powerful work of the Spirit. And we just reject that. There is nowhere in Scripture that says that. So we have to, we look at Scripture. This is what we are, uh, this is what is the foundation for what we do as believers and as followers of Jesus. And so we say, the gifts of the Spirit, the Spirit Himself is in us today and He manifests through us today. And so all of the gifts are available to us today. So what does the New Testament say on the subject? And again, as followers of Jesus, our instruction manual is what? It's the Bible, the Word of God that tells us, it informs us, but it also transforms us. And so as we look at the New Testament, we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 14. And I just want to remind you, in case maybe you're new, and that is, this is the Apostle Paul, who was, uh, he had, uh, he had, founded this church in Corinth, and then was writing to them. Corinth was in Greece, and he was writing this letter to them because he had heard some things about them, that when he was away, he was actually writing this from Ephesus, and he had heard these things, and so he was responding to a letter that had been written to him about the things that were happening at the church at the time. And just some things that he says just in the first few chapters of Corinthians, he talks about that the cross, the cross of Jesus, is foolishness to those who are perishing. You think of, really, your hero is on a cross? That's foolishness. But to us who are, he says, being saved. Did you know that? That you may, you, you have been saved, but you are being saved? You're in the process of being saved and becoming more and more and more like Jesus. That's how we all are. He says, for those who are being saved, it is the power of God. That's 1 Corinthians 1.18. And he says that, he tells us that the, the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of men. That we have in 2.16, 1 Corinthians 2.16, he says, each of us who are followers of Jesus, we have the mind of Christ. Think about that. You have the mind of Christ if you follow Jesus. And you are, he said, you are God's building in 1 Corinthians 3.9. You are God's building being built up and constructed for the power and presence of the Spirit to work through you as a believer. You are God's temple and God's Spirit dwells in you. He says in in chapter 4, verse 10, we are fools for Christ's sake. Have you ever felt like that? Sometimes like a fool for Christ's sake? You just you, you start acting foolishly. Maybe you're, you have this joy, that in, inward joy that comes out and people are wondering, this is not a time maybe for you to be joyful, but you are. And it's just, but you say, it doesn't matter. I love my Lord. I love him. And if, if it means looking like a fool and acting like a fool, then so be it. 
And, uh, and then in, in chapter 4, he also says, uh, For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. So Paul is saying, you know, I, I was, I'm your spiritual father. In Christ Jesus, because of the gospel, because of the good news. And then he says, be imitators of me. So this is who's writing to us that we're about to look at. He's saying to all followers of Jesus, be imitators of him. And we are to say to others, follow me as I follow Christ. And that's humbling, isn't it? It's humbling. That requires God's grace and our yielding to the Holy Spirit. So as we look at 1 Corinthians 14, this is the most in-depth really uh, teaching on the gift of tongues. And it really just is, a, we learned last week, it's a gold mine of information from Paul the Apostle who was teaching the Corinthian church how to exercise this gift properly. And it's a compare and contrast, this chapter, it compares and contrasts the gift of prophecy with the gift of tongues. And he's all about prophecy. He's saying this is really, he's highlighting that gift but he also talks about tongues as well. And he says that all things have to be done fittingly and in order. You know, that church, just to remind you from last week, but the Corinthian church was so into the manifestation gifts, so into just the power and the, the demonstration of that power that they were gathering together in their like Sunday gathering like this, and they were out of control. They were demonstrating that they could speak in tongues, and they were speaking in tongues without interpretation, and they were acting in ways that were out of control. And so Paul is telling them, look, at, there's, there's an appropriate way, a fitting way, to manifest the gifts of the Spirit, including prophecy and tongues. So that's really where he's coming from. And I can say, as I said last week, I think we've got the fittingly and in order. We've got that down. Uh, we do everything in order. We generally just, you know, keep things uh, as they should be. But, but so that's really not our problem with uh, speak, speaking in tongues out loud on a Sunday morning. That's just not really something that we have struggled with. Maybe when we're done with this message, we will. <laughs> I don't know. But that, that's the idea is that we're just going to be so filled with the Spirit that we just want everything that God has for us. So Paul is addressing those problems, and he begins in 1 Corinthians 14.1. He says, Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Pursue love. Pursue it. Go after it until you get it. Follow the way of love is what he's saying. It's all about love. The manifestation gifts, the spiritual gifts, all about love love and pursuing it. And then he says, earnestly desire. And the earnestly desire is aching, coveting, wanting it so badly that there's a pain in your soul for not having it. So, and he tells us that four times in the New Testament that we are to, it, we are to earnestly seek the gifts of the Spirit. And we learned last week that the gifts of the Spirit, pneumaticos, uh, or pneumaticos, however you want to say it, but that, that really that's the real translation for that. And we, and we look at it, it's, it's been translated as the gifts of the Spirit. But one of the things in my uh, search and research that I've done, I've, I've realized that there really is another interpretation and one that is probably more accurate, and that is that it means just the stuff of the Spirit. It means all the things that the Spirit does. And so because it's been translated as the gifts of the Spirit, sometimes we can get hung up on that. We can get hung up on it in the sense that we think, well, I either have this gift or I don't have this gift. When really, and I'm hoping to convince you by the end of this, that really what we're talking about when, when Paul says the pneumaticos, when he's talking about the gifts of the Spirit or the things that the Spirit does, he's saying earnestly seek after everything the Holy Spirit has for you. Everything, all of it. Remember what Jesus said? To all of his disciples, because I go away and you have the Spirit, greater things than, than these that I have done will you do, all of you, all those things. 
So what we're looking at is not just do I have the gift of, of healing or, you know, we sometimes say, oh, I've got the gift of mercy or I've got the gift of, of healing. We don't so often hear people say, I've got the gift of the miraculous. I mean, you don't, hear, you don't see that. You, you would say, oh, yeah, show me, right? Show me that you've got the gift of the miraculous. But we don't really, we kind of shy away from that. But, but, but really, when we think of it as a whole package of the Holy Spirit and all that the Holy Spirit has, that really helps us, I think, to, to realize that, that it's all available to those who seek it and desire it as the Spirit directs by His grace. But if we're open to all that the Spirit has, then the Spirit, by His grace, when He chooses, will work through us. So, and in chapter 12, just so that as, we, as we're looking at 14, Paul kind of wraps chapter 12 into chapter 14. When he's in chapter 12, that's where he says that, that um, now there are variety, varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. He empowers them all in everyone who follows Jesus. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. The manifestation gifts are for the building up, the edifying of the entire church, the common good, everyone and then he tells us, he says, that there, and then that's where in chapter 12 he describes the gifts, but we don't know if it's an exhaustive list. He doesn't say. But the ones that he does describe includes various kinds of tongues and interpretations of tongues. So that's what we're looking at this last two weeks. Um, and we're going to continue as, uh, as we look at chapter 14 and continue our way through it. So... Uh, a working definition that we've been using for tongues or the actual word means language, this language is, is it's a form of prayer. So when, we, when you hear someone talk about tongues, they're saying it's, it, the definition of that, it's a form of prayer and praise that you express to God in a language you do not understand. Have you ever heard somebody speak in a language that you just don't understand? You know, one of the things that we had here recently was, uh, well, I say recently, but it was probably a year ago now, but, um, but Fred Market, you know who Fred Market is? Okay, Fred Market is a, is a kind of world-renowned uh, missionary with YWAM, and he has done tremendous things, amazing things, and it's like an apostle going around the world starting new movements. And he was in a country that he didn't disclose to us, but he disclosed this story. He said he was in a, in a country where there was hostile to Christianity, and he was there with another believer. And they were looking to start a, uh, a church, a missionary program, but they didn't know where to go or what to do. They didn't know anybody in the city. And so he was with his friend. They're praying, and his friend tells him, Fred... I believe that God, the Spirit is leading me to go and talk to those couple of men over there in tongues. That I need to go and talk to them in tongues. And he was sheepish about it. And Fred said, well, if that's what the Spirit's telling you to do, go do it. And so he did. He went up to these strange men and began speaking in tongues. I mean, is that not putting yourself out there to be made a fool of for Christ's sake? And you're saying, that's okay, I'm just going to do it, Lord, even if I'm a fool. So he goes and he starts speaking in the gift of tongues that he has. And he sees that there's a change in the man's expression on his face. And now, mind you, the one speaking in tongues does not know what he's saying. But he's saying these words, and then the man who's hearing him has his eyes just open wide and he puts his hand out like, wait here, and he leaves. And he comes back and he brings another man. And he said, say to me what you said to him. And he was able to communicate that. So he repeated, he just did the spoken tongues again. 
And that this man was the one person in the city who was sensitive to the Spirit and the gospel and was willing to help them and tell them everything they needed to do to start their movement there in that city. It was amazing. So oftentimes we'll learn as we go, we'll learn that, that, that tongues, this, this language initiated by the Spirit in us, it's a heavenly language. We don't understand it without interpretation, but that it can be a language that others understand. Like in that instance, like in Acts chapter 2, but it can also be a heavenly language that no one can understand other um, than the Spirit working through you and, and with interpretation they might understand it. As, uh, as 1 Corinthians 13, though we speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, right? So it's, it could be angelic language as well as the language that others understand. So, so that's what we're talking about when we're talking about tongues or languages. And he goes on in verse 2 and 3, For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. On the one hand, the one who prophesies speaks. So here's, here's what he's saying. is that, And then he says, On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. So if you speak in a tongue, you're not speaking to men, but to God. It's a heavenly language. We call it sometimes a prayer language because we are praying back to God as the Spirit leads. No one understands Him, but He utters mysteries of God. The word there for mysteries is the Greek word mysterion, and it, it means a hidden thing, a secret thing, confided not to ordinary mortals, secret counsel of God. Even if you have doubts about this gift, wouldn't you eagerly want to pursue the secrets of God that God wants to give to you and, and speak to you through the Spirit? And, and I just get that picture of, of the Lord just speaking into my ear a secret. And just that intimacy that you get from that. And that's, that's what's happening. He's speaking mysteries. It's mysteries by, of God by the Holy Spirit. So it's words spoken to God, not to man. Whereas prophecy, on the other hand, is speaking to others on behalf of God. God's speaking through you to others for their upbuilding, encouragement, and consolation. That's one of the reasons why Paul says prophecy is so important. Prophecy in the church is critical. And we have to, I believe, home church, we have to repent because we have not been prophetic to one another. Prophecy means I, I come to you and I believe the Holy Spirit has a word for you and I come and I share it with you. But, but you know what that suggests? Is that before I spoke it, I was over here maybe praying for you, crying out to the Lord for you. Asking the Lord to show me something that I might share with you. That's pursuing love. Love of somebody else. And then acting like the fool and stepping out and saying, you know, I don't know if this is from the Lord, but this is what he's sharing with me to share with you. So, so prophecy, you can see how that builds up others and is so critical to the life of a church. And that we individually have to seek that and see more of that in our midst. He goes on in verse 4, the one who speaks in the tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. So speaking in this heavenly language, can I just ask you, I mean, the one who was speaking in tongues with that Fred Marker situation, do you think he was built up by that? Of course he was. He was built up by the fact that God used him in that way, but, but most, most of the time that and I'll just tell you from my personal experience, when I am praying in this language, when I am, when I am uh, with the Lord on my own and the Spirit is moving through me and I'm praying in this language that is unknown to me, my soul is uplifted and I can feel 
I can feel the breath of the Spirit. I can feel the wind of the Spirit beginning to, to fill me as I spend the time with the Lord. It does build me up. That word edify means to construct. And think of this. As a believer, follower of the Lord, you are constructing by engaging in this. You are allowing the Spirit to construct in you, make more space for God and for the working of the Spirit in your life. How many of us need God to work more in our lives? How many of us need more of God? Yes. Yes, absolutely. I just think of a, a, of, you know, a home that is this little cottage and there's a family of 10 or 12 and there's just no room for the, all of them. So what do they do? Anthony, what do they do? They build another room, right? They build another room. They make it bigger so they have more space so that they can do more of the family thing together. Well, that's what, the, that's what this gift does. It allows you just making space for God to work more in your life. There's more room for the Holy Spirit. So he says it builds himself up, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. In verse 5, he says, Now I want you all to speak in tongues. That's what he said. Let's imagine Paul is speaking to you right now. You're the Corinthian church. He's speaking to all of you. And he says, I want you all to speak in tongues. I want you all to speak in tongues. You would not say, well, he's not talking to me. <laughs> he said the word all, word all didn't he? So, so as we think of that, this is where last week we were trying to put aside our preconceptions. We were trying to put aside our judgments. We're trying to put aside those, or maybe our bad experiences with this gift. And we're saying, you know, just as April said today, it's just humility. We need to humble ourselves and say, Lord, Forgive me. I want all of you, everything you have for me. Forgive me for my unbelief. Forgive me for the times I've rejected this. And I want all that you have for me, including this gift. And knock and seek and search and just continue to pursue it. He says, I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. For the one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. So there is the scale of gifts, isn't there? He's saying there are some gifts are more important than others. And that prophecy, because it edifies the whole church, is at the top. And tongues, because it edifies the individual and the gifts themselves are for the building up of the church, that it's the least of the gifts. It's on the lower end and it causes most of the conflict. So he says, I'd rather you speak in tongues. So what do we learn from this? We learn five things. That these other languages or tongues are spoken to God, not to other people like prophecy. It's number one. These other languages make no sense to you. He says no one understands them. So they make no sense without interpretation. Number three, they edify the speaker, but not the church as a whole. And number four, tongues or other languages are not nearly as important as prophecy. And uh, five, everybody should speak in these other languages or tongues in the pneumatico. So, so this is, I want, to, uh, I, I want to make sure that you understand there. We're not saying if you don't speak in tongues that somehow you're not filled with the Spirit. Or if you don't speak in tongues that you are less than. Please reject that. We reject it. We're just asking you, we're encouraging you, the leadership of the church, encouraging you to pursue this gift if you don't have it. And be open to all that the Spirit might have for you. But remember, Paul is talking about, when he's talking about the gift, primarily talking about the Sunday gathering, the gathering where all are gathered together, not the individual, not the time when you're by yourself and you're alone with the Lord and however you do it. It might be on a walk. It might be uh, with a cup of coffee early in the morning in your favorite chair. He's not talking about that at all. He's talking about exercising this gift when, you're, when you come together. And then he goes on in verse 6. Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? So if I were to come up to you this morning and just start speaking in tongues in my heavenly language, the language that God has given to me, 
that would, not prof, that would not profit you at all, would it? Because you wouldn't understand it without interpretation. And so that's what he's saying. He says, so we don't do that in the gathering on the Sunday morning. We just don't do it because it's just noise without interpretation. So then he goes on and gives some illustrations. And I'm going to ask Benny to come up. Benny, are you here? He's going to show. But Paul, Paul says this. This is what Paul says. He says, if even lifeless, lifeless instruments, verse 7, such as the flute or the harp, do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? So with yourselves, if with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker a foreigner to me. So with yourselves, so with yourselves, he says, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. As Benny is playing here, I want you to, how does this make you feel? Thanks, Benny. That's good. Music needs a key or meter. Otherwise, it's just noise. Now, Benny played. Now, watch me when I play. Okay, Benny, get out. Move out of the way. Okay, I'm going to pull up the seat and everything here. Just watch. Okay, that's how I play. I do not know how to play. And it's just noise, isn't it? I mean, that's just noise. It's not music. And that's what Paul is trying to demonstrate. When we come together, we don't just all start making noise. Because it's unintelligible. It doesn't profit anybody. He even uses the example of the bugler and the bugle. In, in historical times, they would use the bugle because they're in the middle of a battle with tremendous noise and they had to communicate to all the troops wherever they were. And so one particular sound would say retreat or another sound would say charge or another one flanked left or flanked right. But it was communication and they understood it and it would move entire armies. But what if they played the wrong sound? Well, then that would be dangerous, wouldn't it? Could be very dangerous. Well, in the same way, I think that's why he spends this entire chapter on it. Tongues itself in the way it is manifested and used in the church can be dangerous if it's not done fittingly and in order, if it's not done with interpretation. And so, and then he talks about foreign languages, someone speaking in a foreign language, that if you do not understand that language, then we cannot, it, it's a stranger to you, it remains a foreigner, there's no intimacy. So again, in the public gathering, you wouldn't speak out in a tongue to, some, to somebody else because it's, it's meant for God and without interpretation, they generally don't understand it. Now, there are exceptions. If the whole, and remember, the Holy Spirit might lead you to speak to somebody else like that Fred Markert situation in a tongue. But that's not in the gathering, is it? That's separate. That's being led of the Spirit to do something. But Paul is saying in the Sunday gathering, there are certain ways in that you speak. If you speak in a tongue, there must be interpretation. Otherwise, there is no building up of the entire church. And so he uses these metaphors to try to explain it that we would understand. He goes on in verse 13. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret in the Sunday gathering. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. And it, let me just make sure some of you might be really like, I don't even know what you're talking about when you're talking about tongues. What is it? I mean, does God just take over and start moving your mouth and, and you're in a trance of some kind? And, and Paul is saying, when I pray, so he says, when he prays, my spirit 
praise, but my mind is unfruitful. For me, when I'm praying in the Spirit, that's another way of saying praying in tongues, or praying in this language, the Spirit takes over, and the Spirit is speaking. The other day, I was just, throughout the day, was speaking and praying in tongues all day. I, I caught myself doing that. And it was a spirit was just lifting me up and praying through me. It was quiet. Nobody could hear me. It was just under my breath to myself. So nobody heard, but I felt my soul just being uplifted. But my mind is unfruitful. It just means that my mind kind of goes into neutral. And I'm just not, I'm not thinking about other things. I'm, but I'm not in a trance. My eyes don't roll back in my head or anything like that, so don't get any of those ideas. But, it's, but Paul says, he goes on in verse 13, what am I to do? He says, I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say Amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you are saying. And so outsider, he's talking about somebody who is not a follower of Jesus, who happens to come in on a Sunday morning, and somebody is now speaking in tongues, and, they, and he doesn't understand it. So he says, how can this outsider, this person who is not a follower, understand and say amen to what you are saying? For you may be, give, be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. And that is always the question. If you speak in this gift, in this language, where others are present without interpretation, is somebody being built up? Is another person being built up by the exercise of that gift? So he says, therefore, one who speaks in the tongue should pray that he may interpret. I don't know if you've been in a situation like that, but we, we used to have some, some gatherings here a long, long time ago, how many of you remember them? We'd get together on a Sunday or a Wednesday, and we'd gather in the church, and there would be some who would stand up, and they would actually have a tongue. But it wasn't a Sunday morning gathering. It was separate for believers who were gathered together to worship the Lord, and somebody would have a tongue. And Pastor Mike would make it very clear, okay, you're speaking in a tongue. Who has the interpretation? Oftentimes, in that setting, the person with the tongue also has the interpretation. So they come prepared. They're praying. They're, 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 they're asking the Holy Spirit to also give them the interpretation or the translation of what is they're about to share. So that it's always done in, uh, fittingly and in order. Again, with the main purpose of the manifestation gifts being to build up the body of Christ. He goes on to say in verses 18 and 19, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. And the 10,000, the Greek word for that, is the biggest number in their language. It just means whatever's the biggest number. For us, it would be one centillion, I think. But it's, it, he's saying I would speak, you know, one centillion. I would rather speak, he says, 10, 000, than 10,000 words in a tongue. Rather, five words with my mind in order to be understood and to instruct others. But he did say, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. And you know, just reading and researching this, it was, it's pretty, pretty common that the scholars believe that the Corinthian church did not believe Paul spoke in tongues. Because he never did it in the gathering. He never did it for their benefit. They never heard it or saw it. So this was like a grenade. When he says to them in his letter, I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. They probably read that letter and said, Paul? Paul speaks in tongues? Amazing. So this is Paul, but he's not doing it to be, to be known by others. That's not what it's for. So they did not, they probably were not aware of it. Romans 8.26 you know, so, so oh, before I go there, so often, have you ever been in a situation where you just don't know what to pray for somebody? You want to pray for them. You feel compelled to pray, but you don't know what to pray. Or you, you might, I've had this situation where all of a sudden one of you or somebody in my family comes to mind, and I haven't talked to them. I don't know what's going on, and I can't find out. 
That's when I just start praying in the Spirit. I just start saying, Lord, you know what's happening. Holy Spirit, pray right now. I need to pray. And I just start praying in the Spirit. And, and just the other day, I was praying my morning time with the Lord, and I was just praying in the Spirit. And just as I'm praying in the Spirit, all of a sudden, one of your faces would come up. And I would just pray for you. Or the church just says, pray for the church right now. And so I'm just praying in the Spirit, and I know the Holy Spirit's telling me, you're praying for the church right now. The Holy Spirit wants to pray through you for the church or for your children or for other needs. Romans 8.26, he says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. That's what we long for, is that the Spirit would Pray through us back to the Father. 26 to 28, what then, brothers? He, Paul says, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or at most three. So he's putting limits on it. Hey, maybe two, at most three, if you do it in the, in the main gathering. But let... He says, do it each in turn and let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in the church and speak to himself and to God. He goes on in verse 29. Let two or three prophets speak and let others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all be encouraged. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. So Paul is definitely saying on the scale of manifestation gifts, prophecy, when you're together, is more important, most important. All of you should prophesy. All of you. But take turns in doing that. You know, as I was uh, listening to... Uh, a pastor who was teaching on the gift of prophecy, one of the things he said was that he said when he first became uh, a believer, he was learning about the gifts, and and one of his pastors came to him and sat with him and said, John, would you prophesy over me? And he was like, me? Yeah, you, prophesy over me. He says, I don't know how to do that. He said, just pray for me. And so he says, I just started to pray for him. And as I started to pray for him, God was giving me scriptures. There were truths about all followers. So he was able to pronounce those truths over him. And then the Holy Spirit gave him more things to say. He had to open his mouth, didn't he? He had to be obedient. And he says he opened his eyes, and his pastor was just in tears because the Spirit had spoken right to him. This is what Paul says has to happen in the church. So he clearly is saying tongues is on the lower end. Prophecy is at the height. And we all need it. And it needs to be present in our churches. It's vital to the church. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. And the word peace there is harmony. Just think of the word harmony. Just think of a I, I think of a, a band or a group, orchestra, who's they're in sync and they're synchronized, and there's this beauty that comes from their synchronization, the harmonies, the peace that comes when we do things in order and we follow the Word of God. We are blessed when we do it. So he ends earnestly, says, desire to prophecy in verse 39. Do not forbid speaking in tongues. I know I've told you all these things. I've set all these rules. Tongues is very important too. It's for the self-edification of each believer. So do not forbid speaking in tongues, but all things should be done decently and in order. I just want to end with this as the worship team comes, but I just want to cover three things just in the closing. Paul says we should earnestly seek the manifestation gifts, including tongues including this language. But there are, the reality is some of you listening to me or watching or here, the reality is some of you don't eagerly desire it. 
You just don't want it. It scares you. Um, it brings, maybe because of some of the abuses you've, you've experienced in the past, maybe a theological tradition that you have uh, been engaged in, that maybe you found ways to, you just feel like you, you found ways to justify that in Scripture where you say, well, the gifts are not for today. I mean, you'd have to find ways around the plain meaning of the New Testament because it's very clear. Um, you may have, you, many of you may say, well, we're just rationally wired. I, I'm just an intellectual, and, I'm, and I don't, I, I believe that really this stuff is not for those who are smart. <laughs> and, uh, right, I mean, we, we feel like, well, no, you know, that's for the uneducated or, or some, you know, just so you know, some of you don't know, is that I'm an attorney. I'm generally very logical and rational. But that gets in the way. So often it gets in the way of the Spirit working. But when I just sit with Jesus and allow the Spirit to flow and to work and read the Word and believe it, that just God works in my mind. He works through my mind. But that's not the only portal Right? That is not the only portal that he works in us to connect with him. So I want to encourage you if, you, if you don't eagerly desire it, to really repent of that and say, I'm sorry that I wouldn't want everything you have for me. Forgive me, Lord. And let me, let, let me sit with you, Jesus. Jesus always meets us where we are, right where you're at in that space not where he wants you to be but where you are don't feel like you have to get it right before you can come to him come to him now and allow him to touch you but there are others who eagerly desire it but you haven't received it you're saying I want that I haven't received it and yes I want it what do I do don't give up don't stop asking don't stop seeking God wants a relationship with you and so it's it's the seeking which draws you to Him. So create space. Just create space. Find this time where you're alone with the Lord. Create space. Or, or come and we'll pray for you. And you ask God for it. And then you step out. You have to speak. It's a language. It's like when I'm speaking Spanish and I'm speaking to these people from Mexico and they're all lo looking at me and I don't want to speak because I know my Spanish is not as good as it should be. But I have to speak. So I make an effort and I speak a word. I, let, I, exhale, I exhale and I speak. I utter a word. We have to do the same. When, you have, when you're trying to speak this language, you have to step out and begin to speak. And then practice. Just practice. So create space, ask God, step out and practice. And if God has blessed you with a gift, use it. Use it. Use it for your self-edification. Use it to be built up. Use it to create more and more space for God to work in your life. I can testify he's done that for me. Use it, but do everything in order and under control. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the truths of the word of God and the spirit of God. May we follow you and yield entirely to your spirit. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.